Hello folks, I'm Dan. And what we're doing today is we're going to talk a little bit about grinding tool bits and setting up to turn on your lathe. What prompted this is on one of the forums why we've got a guy with a 6 inch acorn lathe that's having a problem getting a good finish on his lathe. And I thought I'd go over some of the suggestions that I've got for him. Now, I, I by no means know everything there is to know, but I'm going to throw out a few suggestions that a lot of people will probably disagree with, but maybe it'll give him some ideas of things he can try and, and get a little bit better surface finish on what he's cutting. And I'm just out in the shop today. I came out to clean up a little bit. We've Today's Mother's Day here, and we had the big bike out and put about a little over 100 miles on it today. And uh, I'm trying to motivate myself and decide if I want to go out and wash it up here this afternoon before it gets too late, although I'm having problems getting motivated. And I made the mistake of sitting down and looking at the computer, and I see some of the guys are flexing their muscles again and explaining how great they are at sharpening tool bits, and their egos are pushing them along. So I thought I'd throw my two cents worth in. Hopefully it'll help him a little bit. These are some of the things that I would check on his little lathe just to get into turning a... a little bit better finish on it. A lot of times when you're starting out you don't know where you're going to start with and you get all kinds of input from everybody and granted most of these guys know what they're talking about but it's kind of hard to convey what you're doing unless you've unless you've got somebody standing right there explaining to you how to do something sometimes it's kind of hard to understand what's what's being suggested to you. So I thought we'd look at my lathe a little bit. I've got my 10 inch shelled in here and one of the things that's brought up is if you've got a wore out lathe you're not going to be able to do this stuff and I'm going to show you a very wore out Sheldon lathe here which granted it's not an atlas but it will uh, it'll the principles are the same and it'll show what you can do with a wore out lathe. Um, I've got a bunch of tool bits here. Um, my tool post that's on the lathe right now is a uh, quick change tool post. It's an AXA clone. One of the things I will suggest on his little 6 inch, he's trying to, to work some carbide with it too. On a little 6 inch acorn lay that's probably worn enough that he's probably going to have a hard time getting a real good surface finish with carbide inserts. Um, they're not going to be sharp enough. They are designed more for a production environment where you're running a more rigid lathe and heavier speeds. You can run carbide once you kind of know what's going on with your lathe, but you need to, to understand what your lathe is doing and, and knowing how your particular machine works and, and what its shortcomings are to, to probably get the maximum utilization out of that. I run a combination of both um, carbide and high-speed steel. For the most part, I run high-speed steel on most of the things that I do on my Sheldon lathe steel because I can grind my bits. I can do it quick and easy. If I'm running carbide, I do run some insert stuff. I do run some uh, brazed carbide tool bits. Uh, I will resharpen those on a green wheel. I've got a six inch bench grinder that I use just for grinding lathe tools. You're not supposed to use a green wheel on high speed steel and it doesn't cut as well. I have done it, but I reserve my green wheel specifically for carbide now. I've got a little bit coarser wheel on the other side of that bench grinder and I'll do a little bit of high-speed steel there. If I'm sharpening something special that I'm using the corn tool and cutter grinder on it, why I use diamond if I'm doing carbide and uh, aluminum oxide if I'm running high-speed steel or sharpening end mills or specific geometry on lay tooling, that type of thing. Geometries that are recommended or the, the probably the best geometries for grinding high-speed steel tool bits you're going to find in the Atlas Manual of Lathe Operation, Sheldon's Lathe Operation Manual, South Bend, they all have the same information in them or basically the same information that will apply to all of them. I've got the AXA Quick Change Tool Post. That's the tool post that I primarily use on this. I have two other tool posts. One is a tool post that I built several years ago that's a Quick Change Tool Post but it's an oddball and I have adapted a couple of the tool heads that I use for onto this AXA holder. Um, so I do use some of that older tooling there. A lantern style tool post is actually probably one of the best things to learn on. And everybody talks about the downsides to a lantern style tool post. When you're learning to grind tooling, when you're first learning to operate that lathe, it has a whole lot of advantages because you can adjust your rake and things like that. And, and I'm actually going to put a lantern tool post back on this one at some point just to do a quick little demonstration. What I'm going to do is I'll bring you over. We'll look at some of these uh, tool bits that I've got. I'm going to go over and I'm going to grind one just on the belt sander. Um, and I've got a bunch of oddball stuff. I picked a, a piece of Rex tooling that was set up as a round nose tool originally. Let's see if we can get this into if it's going to, yeah, it's going to show us that. It does not have any top rake 
ground into it. I'm going to grind that top rake and I'm going to re-radius the front. Now geometries for this particular one and a lot of things that are in my little tray of tool bits are not going to be optimal angles and I'm going to say at this stage of the game for what he's trying to do and to learn it, it doesn't matter. It's not that important because it can all be adjusted and you can you can make it work and it's all a learning experience as we go. So anyway, I'm going to bring you over. We'll look in this little tray that's got a whole lot of tool bits in it. Some of the stuff is stuff that I bought new and have ground or pre-ground at least. Some of it's stuff that I bought from various sources over the years, used stuff. A lot of this lay tooling is stuff that's been specially formed for one thing or another. Um, this piece here, of course, this would be the orientation of it. It's a right-hand tool bit for something. It was cut back here, I'm sure, for relief of some form or another. It cuts, works well. You know, all of this stuff is just kind of oddball stuff that's been specifically formed for one thing or another. There's a there's a small grooving or somewhat of a radius. There will be another turning tool bit. And most of these are ground goofy. When you look at this one, this would be the orientation for this tool, or it would cut in this manner and be oriented that way if you're traversing across. Um, when you look at it, you've got your front cutting edge here. When you look back here, it's got a lot of goofy grind where the rest of this looks pretty well honed. It was it was ground all the way back here for relief at some point in time for something. And um, then clearances were cut on and it was honed. It's a, it's a good piece of tool steel. It'll uh, cut well. Somebody's, you know, it's I probably honed it out and I probably used it for quite a bit but anyway that's what all of this this tooling is this is a this is a pre-ground I believe that's a left hand tool tool bit there and it's got the clearances in it so anyway all this stuff you'll as time goes on you specially grind them for one application or another and they work well so anyway it's not as important as we really think it is forget for getting optimal use out of it as it is but uh for general purpose use and as you learn to do this stuff why it's not as imperative as everybody thinks it is. Now what I'm going to do with this one is I'm going to leave pretty much this profile. I'm going to give us a little more radius across the front and then we're going to cut a relief on the back side to turn this into a right hand turning tool. And uh, it's going to be a quick and easy one. We're going to hit it on the belt sander is what I'm going to do with it just to radius the edge and we'll cut a little relief on the back and we'll hit it with a diamond hone, about a medium grit diamond hone and I'll bet it'll cut real well. This is an edge that would have been better cut on the bench grinder than on the belt sander. I could have got in there and gotten a little more radius cut. Um, it's not optimal, but there's where the beginning of our cutting edge is right there rolling around. We'll set it on that. So we've got angle going off the side. So we're going to take this over, set it to the side, and we're going to go back to the lathe, and we're going to make a couple of changes there. All right, well, we're here at the Sheldon. Now, this was set up last for me to cut the left-hand Acme thread on the um, cross slide screw for the production cross slide on the um, little 10 inch atlas lathe. So this was a setup for that, everything's reversed and I've got everything's, everything's goofy from what I normally run it. Um, we're set at a 30 degree angle this way or something <laughs> close. Now what we're going to do is we'll swing the compound back around to the standard setting which they say 29 and a half to 30 degrees. I think if you're any place from 29 to about 31, especially on a small little 6 inch or even a 10 inch atlas lathe, you're going to be plenty plenty close enough. You're not going to be able to hold tolerances any closer than that, even though I'm sure that the, the naysayers out there are going to say, oh yeah, they do it all the time and they're holding to a, to a tenth and all that stuff. So anyway, I swung it back over to um, 30 degrees. We're going to change this tool post out. Now see, this is another tool bit. I ground this. This was just one of my existing bits that came out of the box. I hand ground that so we've got clearance and it was already shaped fairly well but we had to narrow it down to, to actually set it up for the uh, for the Acme thread, for that half ten Acme thread and that's what we ground and put it in and, and it came out just fine. So we'll set that out of the way and that's one of the advantages of high speed steel is you just grind them to, to match what you need them to do. My normal tool bits I run well, my tool bit selection is right here on the wall. And we're going to see.
see. Let's see. We may have to move this camera back a little bit. I want to show the. I want to show the, some of the play in this lathe anyway on the digital readout when we get that far. So, anyway, these are my normal tool bits. I normally only use primarily one, two, three, four, about six of those, five or six of them. And these are, well, the, the primary ones are all high-speed steel. So what's going to happen here, we have to move the tool post around because it was set backwards for the, for the other, for the acne thread. So anyway, our compound's already set. We get it about centered up where it goes. We're going to set up this tool bit right here. And one of the one of the problems he was having was there was a couple of things I noticed. I think his compound was set at 90 degrees parallel to the lathe bed. You need to swing that compound around because if you've got it at 90 degrees, especially if your setup's not rigid, why that's going to allow some play in it. So anyway, get your compound set about 30 degrees. I swing my uh, tool post right there, leave it loose, and we can run it right up against the edge of the chuck. We're square to the world and that's set. I uh, set up all my tool bits and my holders so that my cutting geometry is set up so that when the uh, tool holder is parallel to the chuck or 90 degrees to the to the bed why that's the proper place for it to, to be. All I have to do is drop that tool holder in place and it's uh, it's good to go. Compound at 90 degrees or at uh, 30 degrees Go ahead and lube everything up. Lube your spindle bearings if you have access to those. Lube your ways, lube all your gibs and everything. You'll find that tightens up the, the mechanism quite a bit when you've got that film of oil in there. So that may reduce part of your chatter or part of your, your grabbing and marking you're getting on your, on your cuts. Now when we look at this lathe, this lathe is well worn. Now we're about, we're about in the normal position where it's going to operate where it spent most of its life. This is about where the work envelope that it's been in. So this is where we're at with it. And this, this lathe is well worn. When we do this, you probably can't see it there, but there's quite a bit of play in there. And I normally will operate this lathe in inches, but for the sake of this, we're going to do millimeters. And if we look at this digital readout, if we can get it here without getting too much glare on it. Yeah, let me move this over so we see. Let's look at the digital readout here. And we're going to pull everything back. And let's go ahead and zero everything out. Now this lathe is well worn. We're setting millimeters here. Now, if I push the compound itself, 0.41 millimeters. You know, we've got almost half a millimeter there. Um, well, and it's 0.59, we've got better than half a millimeter on the compound. Now, that's a combination of both the compound and the cross slide for the most part. Although we got almost half a millimeter movement in the in the saddle or in the apron when we did that too. Now, if we, yeah, see, I bet we've got at least a, a millimeter of play in the apron itself. Just in, and that's going to be wear in the apron and the uh, engagement on the lead screw with the But this is just the compound movement, 0 0.61, 0 0.14. If we zero that back out, 0.48. We've got almost half a millimeter just in the compound. So this lathe is well worn, and I know that. I've used this lathe for a lot of years. It was worn when I got it. Yet this lathe will still do long-range rifle work. I do, a, oh, over the years, I've done probably an average of six or eight rebarrels a year and it uh, a lot of that's been hunting guns but here the last few years it's been long range guns thousand yard guns the reason this wore out old lathe is capable of doing that is because it spent most of its life right here in the in this area where it is when you run a 26 or a 28 inch rifle barrel in it and You've got muzzle end in this, and you're working on the chamber on the other end, 26 inches away. We're clear down at the end of that head or of the bed, so there's been very little use on that end of the bed. So I've got a lathe that, for that application, is in very good shape. So anyway, nonetheless, that's how I get away with doing it. And it's not so much that 
I'm a great machinist, it's just that I've used this lathe for so long that I know its capabilities and what it can do. So, to turn this with this, we're going to change this tool post or this tool holder out, and we're going to face this off. And this is just a piece of rusty old crap that I've got. Let's see if we can't face it off, and then we'll center drill it and we'll turn it with a live center in the tailstock. Let's get her fired up here. Now, what I'd suggested is the way it looked to me from his pictures of having trouble with this running, why compound was set at 90 degrees. I'd get that compound at, at uh, 30 degrees, move your move the things you can to the end of their travel to get the as much of the slop as you can now see this is where this compound has worked for the most part is in this area where it's set right now and i realize this isn't a good picture but it's pretty much centered up over the the, the front of the compound is flush with the casting on the front of it now if you take this compound and run it back back to a stop there we've eliminated a lot of that play right there so if you do that while well, you've eliminated one of the possible points of flexure right there so let's fire this up and see if we get what kind of a cut we get now i haven't resharpened any of these tool bits for this this is just the way they were hanging in the hanging in the rack We've got a center hole there. Let's put a live center, and this is indeed a live center. And let's extend our stock out here a little bit. This is just going to be a general roughing tool. This has been sharpened several times. I do have a chip breaker ground into the front edge of it. We're set just about on center, which is where we want to be for this. Tighten everything down. We're just going to knock the scale off of this and see if we can do this without me catching a cord someplace. Okay, now if we start really trying to just hog it, now we can screw up our surface finish. Okay, that's not a perfect surface finish, but it's not bad. Now see here, you can see where we quit lubing, we started forcing the feed a little bit and everything, it's really chattery. Let's change that out to a, what I'm going to consider my finishing tool for here. And there again, I haven't, uh, I haven't specifically sharpened this. Let's see what we can do here.
Yeah, those aren't perfect finishes. If I would hone those tools, we could do better. Now let's just swap this out and put a lantern style tool post on there. Now the advantage to using a lantern style tool post is we can adjust our rake angle. Plus we can get it centered more over the compound. Now we're going to take our ugly ground tool here. And we want to get them in pretty close. You don't want them hanging way off into space here. Which I think is part of this problem he was having too. Give that a little gunk. This is just a neutral tool holder. Just going to kind of set this by eye. Right about there, I think. And that's the advantage of a lantern style tool post is you can run it, you can change your rake angle. pretty easily. Yeah, I think that might look pretty good. Now we're not set perfectly perfectly square to the world. This is just kind of set on there. We're not going to take a very heavy cut speed up our feed or our spindle speed just a little bit give us a little lube there Now another thing you might consider as you learn this stuff is instead of cutting steel, throw a piece of aluminum in there. A piece of aluminum round stock will uh, give you a lot more confidence right off the bat because it won't take you too awful long to figure out how to make those adjustments without really tearing stuff up on your, on your stock you're trying to turn. Now see of course this is going to be finished, considered a finishing pass and if you run these under power feed why you'll usually get a smoother finish yet. Now this tool bit was already ground to some extent, you know, so we took quite a bit of the time of grinding it off, but uh, from where it was to convert it to where I thought it would cut relatively well it took us all of about two minutes including honing the edge of it. So we don't have a whole lot of time invested. And if you take your time, watch your feed rates, watch your speeds, all that stuff that goes along with it. All it takes is practice to make this stuff work. So there's no great black magic to it. It's just experience and doing it. So everybody can tell you on the internet all they want about how great they are doing this stuff and, you know, what you should be doing. But all you do is just get in there and start doing it and you'll end up and pretty soon you've got good cuts going on and you're getting the dimensions you want and everything looks as it should. This is just a piece of unknown stock. It's some sort of a mild steel, whether it's 1018 or some other alloy. It's nothing really, really spectacular. Now see, there's still a few tricks I can do to make the finish even better on this. I could have gone back and lubed the, the spindle bearings. Would have tightened it up a little bit more and giving us a little bit better finish on it. But I was curious just what I was going to end up with by just going ahead and cutting it the way it was. Because I think I've shown that this lathe is well used and abused. It's been well worn. You know, it came into my shop more than 20 years ago. 
and it was wore out then. So it's done real well for me here. They make a great gunsmith lathe and it's uh, made me a whole lot of money over the years. Carbide will have its application in the shop, but I think everybody, if you're going to do this very much, you need to take the time to learn to grind high-speed steel because high-speed steel has so many more applications. It's so much easier to create form tools with it. You're only going to use for one or two little jobs, and they can be reground so easily that I think it's a skill that everybody needs if you're going to act as a act as a machinist, even in your own little home hobby shop. These same grinds basically work on the shaper. You know, I, I run more of a, a straight tool usually or a round nose tool with a um, with quite a bit more back rake for in the shaper tool holder. But the grind is basically the same. That's a very nice finish on there. Now, earlier when I told you that it didn't matter how your the grind angles weren't important for the most part, and we're going to demonstrate that right here because this is cut as a right angle tool. Our rake angle on the top is set both back and drops to the right. So what we're going to do is it's going to optimally cut better from left to right. What we're going to do is we're going to plunge it here just a little bit. We're not going to go very much, but then we're going to use it as a left hand cutting tool. So see what kind of results we get there. Okay, we can see that, but you can't feel it. Yeah, we got just a little bit, but that's a uh, that's a pretty good surface finish. I'm really happy with that. Okay, there's a high-speed steel, not an optimal angle on cutting edges, and it's cut under power feed, and that's a really nice finish. You can play with your angles and get them right, and uh, you can end up with a really nice, really nice part. Let's see, there's finish on that. And those aren't hard to achieve. You know, it's just a, a matter of practice and taking the time to learn what you're doing. Hopefully that will give you a little bit of insight on, on sharpening your tool holders and getting stuff set up. I think with carbide tooling on a, on a little 6 inch well worn lathe, you're probably going to have trouble getting a, getting a good finish on it. But, you know, all of the stuff about, you know, your lathe being wore out and your chucks being wore out and all the things that go along with it those are all those can all be worked around you know it's just taking the time to learn the machine and and what its capabilities are and with some practice why it's within anybody's capabilities to do that so practice with a little bit if you got any questions shoot me an email or leave them in the comment section for me below and i'll do my best to answer them for you so thanks for taking the time to watch